So the job came in and it was making these bigger wheels into the smaller diameter wheels. The, uh, these are for a Thicol snow, snow cat. And uh, anyway, they said there's enough material in here to be able to turn them down and that's what we're gonna do. When you're working with rubber, one of the old things you'll see in a lot of stuff, and I have never tried this, I've been aware of it for a long time. I have never seen it actually done in industry. I've seen pictures of people doing it for home shops and stuff where they take and use a coolant pan, put a pan underneath your piece and sort of like, um, and put some kind of a thinner in there. Usually they used to use mineral spirits. And then they'll put uh, dry ice in the pan so that it cools it way down, makes the rubber harder, so the rubber's not moving. And on an extremely, some piece of rubber, you may need that. I have never had to do that. Uh, there's other ways to do it. It would kind of be a mess, uh, but it may be a way to do it. I always keep it in mind. That is the first way I learned about, but I never had another machinist show me to do it that way. And we always just talked about it and said, yeah, not really. Don't need to. Okay, so one of the common things, let's say we have a sheet of rubber. So if you have a sheet of rubber, what you would do is right here, you'd have a face plate and it could be a piece that you put in the a lathe chuck and faced off or just, but normally an aluminum plate. And the simplest thing then, while I a lot of times will put a nut and a washer, a bolt, not a nut, but a bolt and a, I'll thread the plate bolt and a washer in the middle of it to kind of help hold the piece of rubber up there. But the other thing I'll do is I'll just put uh, contact cement on it. It doesn't hold that super hard, but it holds hard enough to be able to work with it. And so if you're making like square rings and you're making it out of fairly flat rubber, then I take just like a parting tool and I sharpen it so it's like a knife blade. And I basically push into the rubber and the rubber separates to both sides and you don't really even remove a chip when you're doing that. Works really good when you need a square cut O-ring. Square cut O-rings are not that common. And also if you're dealing with stuff that has square cut O-rings, make sure you're not going overboard by having to, by forcing yourself to make a square one because a lot of times they're the same specs as an O, as a uh, round cord O-ring and just a standard O-ring a lot of times will replace it just fine without a problem. There's some design reasons why a square one is better and some reasons why a round is better. Today's on cutting rubber so we won't get into the design changes but sometimes you can interchange them and especially in a pinch when you don't have something. So one of the ways like I say is you knife it and as you're knifing rubber uh, anytime that you're knifing it like that you have to remember that the rubber around it has to move past the knife. It has to, so if you had a knife with a whole bunch of material below it, say I came in there and I was coming into the plate to where the bottom part, well that rubber would have to force itself around all of this lower part of the blade and it would try and tear. That would be a problem. So what we would do is normally we're not going to knife into a piece of rubber that's more than about three eighths of an inch thick. We're also, when we grind this into, just a knife, just a real sharp knife. Then we will take and eliminate most of the blade below it. So we essentially just have one little, like an X-Acto knife out here at the edge, coming in and cutting your piece that would be on your material, your uh, plate. Now, another thing which really, really helps when you're doing something where you are cutting the rubber um, where you're just slicing it like that is a little bit of light lubricant. I won't mention any direct brands, but this one is the one I've used the most times. And uh, there's several others too. Any, any light lubricant, if you look in old machinery manuals and things, they'll generally say kerosene, which is just a light lubricant. Um, it does tend to catch fire a little bit too. Number one diesel might be a little better, but this stuff is handy. It's already pre-pressurized. That's, you know, that's the biggest reason, not that it's the best for this, but it's handy. You can't, psh, psh, comes out. Okay, so now another thing is if we're going to cut and make chips. Well, if you're going to cut and make chips, and that is the tool that I've got in here, because that's sort of what I was starting out to do today. And when I sharpen them, I always sharpen the very final edge with a diamond. 
so that it's nice and sharp, has a nice knifey edge to it. And this started out cutting some little stringers, but the stringers uh, were getting bound up around the chuck and it cut stringers with a deeper depth. Um, it was starting to pull and tear a little bit on the inside here. That's one of the things you learn with rubber too. There's not an absolute rule. <laughs> You're gonna have to play a little bit. The more experience you gain, the more you can venture into cutting up of customers, I don't know what these cost, but something. <laughs> um, versus where you're just feeling like you can work with a piece of flat rubber that is expendable. A, oh, where was I, something else. Very important that I was thinking. Tips, customers, parts, cheap. Oh, I know exactly what it was, yes. Okay, so what I ended up with here is going back to the, um, actually taking a smaller cut is where, and because I had enough catchy, sketchy things, I'm not even gonna, other than the fact that there are stringer chips that came off of this, so you can believe me that they came off as chips, uh, string chips. And when you get these string chips, sometimes you wrap these up. Uh, you'll take a spool out here, go at a speed where you can wrap these up like a little drill motor to keep them out of your way because they will tangle and be a problem. But also, don't get to where you're sucking yourself in with that motor. Um, what I was doing was making a tangle here and it was just a pretty good tangle by the time I got to the end and then I'd cut them off with a knife. But what I'm doing now is I'm just letting this reverse. I have a thickness to where it starts in cutting it and I can spray the WD-40 and it just reverses and it folds back and I have just one layer at a time that is cutting off of here. Now, the big thing that I had forgotten a second ago and that is if you want to remove a lot of material all at once, it doesn't make a nice smooth cut like a knife tool, lathe knife tool of some sort. And I do say knife tool because what you want on this, no matter how you look at it, very, very high rake angle. You want a knife, as close to an out-and-out -out knife, even if we're cutting to make chips and make, make a stringer chip and make it turn, you want it to cut like a knife. You don't, don't think in your normal metal, if you were doing the frozen, then they used standard metal working tools when they were doing that trick. And like I said, I've never done that. But the big thing is, if you want to remove a huge amount in a hurry, give up on these kind of ideas for, for removing a large amount and saw it. Just plain take a regular everyday saw and cut it. Now again, uh, a little bit of lubrication will help your saw, but don't get so much that the saw itself is slimy and nasty to hang on to and causing another danger. And what you do a lot of times, and when I first started on this job, what I was gonna do, I had it scheduled this morning, I was gonna run into town along with a little other stuff, which I now have put off till tomorrow, but I was gonna go and buy a hole saw because you take a hole saw and you put this on a milling machine, guide it in here, sets on a piece, bolt it down, and then you take your hole saw and you cut it with a hole saw. The hole saws for the size I need will only go an inch and a half deep. So at an inch and a half deep, this is just shy of three inches. I could actually do it as far as Come in, go to the other side, maybe touch it up a little bit with a knife in between, you know, just work it around. The problem is, though, this seal. Because of what this is for, obviously they've had trouble with these seals coming out. Instead of making a nice flange on here or something to hold this in, they decided that they would just plain beat these in with some little dots. And so if I force the seal out, then I ruin those or I ruin the seal and it's never the same new roller that it was. So I can't take the seal out so that I can bolt it on the mill one way, turn it over, bolt it on the mill the other way to do my hole saw. So once I realized that, I said, yeah, no reason to go to town and let's just work on doing this on the lathe. The reason I didn't want to do it on the lathe is taking an eighth of an inch of a cut takes more time. And while this part may be expensive and the people that made it said that it would be cheaper to have him have it turned, uh, they're not paying my wages and he may or may not find it cheaper. And I, I like to try and give the best deal for the customer. So the whole saw would have really been quick, but we just can't do it because of the seal. And uh, so now that being said, we can go ahead and we can watch a little peel out of an eighth inch coming off of this. 
And we won't take this all the way down to finish because I realized coming in here next to my rotating tailstock chuck, this right here will hit the edge of this tool. I'm going to have to grind a third of this tool away before I can go into the full diameter. Mm. But at least for now, you will get to see how a, uh, one of the layers comes off of this when we turn it. And I will be right in there running. So I go to 875. Just take our handy dandy utilator knife and we utilate it. Put it in the done pile. And when we get done, it be the right size. We have three of these to do. So, yep. Um, yeah, we're, I, we did a video all about uh, machining rubber, which of course it's never all about everything. And there's some comments already came out on that. And the audio was a little messed up. So we wanted to make it better so that you could enjoy it more. So along with that, um, one of the things somebody had mentioned was that they definitely had seen somebody doing some machining and they did all stringer cuts with, you know, stringer coming off, off. And any time that it would turn, like my piece that I turned inside out while cutting, they would quit, uh, which was on a long piece of rubber. Well, that comes back to you got to play with things, you got to think about it. Because obviously, if we have a piece that's four foot long and we're trying to turn it inside out for the whole four foot, eventually it's just going to wad up and it's going to rip your tool off of the lathe. And I've seen some people try some long cuts on stuff with that same, re and it doesn't work. No. Um, someone was asking about. Um, my utilization, what that was, that was using a utility knife to cut the piece at the end that had reversed. That was what I called utilization. So that answers that. Um, also, grinding is another way for cutting rubber. And they do that a lot for printing rolls. They will actually grind them. Um, it was mentioned again about someone had said that freezing, they would freeze rubber and machine it. I believe that. It's the one that I didn't really see anybody doing, uh, never is where instead of like freezing the rubber, bringing it cold from, say, packing it in dry ice, letting it set there, get cold, put it in your machine and machine it. I can see that really easily as being a benefit. Liquid nitrogen, what I've dealt with with rubber is, I think you'd likely break the thing before you do anything else. It's, it's too brittle. In fact, for fun, we, we break rubber when we're playing with liquid nitrogen all the time. So I'm thinking the dry ice is probably in the range, although some rubbers would break already by the time that it was 100 below. So that's, you know, again, there's, there's trial and error on that. And then one last little thing that I had forgotten to mention while I was talking about knifing in against a faced plate to cut square rings out of uh, sheet stock, you go ahead and knife all the way in to where you touch the aluminum plate, and that's why the plate is aluminum. It could be mar micarta, it could be all kinds of different things, but that's why you're using a soft material for the plate, is because you want to be able to go all the way in where you cleanly cut the rubber in two by touching the base plate. 